It's my, my name's Helen Bagnall, and it is my great pleasure to be here as part of the Melting Pot uh, Forum for the Colors of Ostrava Festival. Welcome to The Peace is Possible. In a few moments, we're going to be hearing from uh, incredible speakers, Dr. Silla Elworthy and uh, John Perkins, who will be talking for about 20 minutes each. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo <-hoo -hoo>. <laughs> <laughs> um, both, both Silla and uh, John will talk for about 20 minutes, and then we will have time uh, to open up for questions. So uh, please do have your questions ready. It'd be great to hear from you. Sorry about my levels. Uh, so that just, it just remains for me to do a quick introduction of both of our speakers. Silla, welcome to Ostrava. <laughs> uh, yeah, can I use a handheld? Yeah. Excuse me, just a second. Thank you, John. Um, this is uh, Dr. Silla Elworthy. Silla has been nominated three times for the Nobel Prize for Peace. In her own words, she has been stopping people killing killing people for 45 years. Um, she's renowned for her work setting up the Elders Peace Program uh, with Nelson Mandela and with uh, Jimmy Carter. And she's going to be talking to us about her book, The Business Plan for Peace. Uh, we'll then be hearing from John Perkins. Uh, John is a former chief economic advisor. Uh, he's advised the UN Fortune 500 uh, companies, and he's the author of the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and also the new confessions, which he's going to be talking about today. It's my great honor to share a stage with him. As he told me backstage, he's also the winner of the John Lennon Peace Prize, a prize he had to share with Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ostrava, John. <laughs> Can't quite promise that. <laughs> Sharing it with Silla, exactly. So Silla, perhaps you'd like to talk to us about the business, business plan for peace. Thank you. In 1956, I was sitting in front of a grainy black and white television in my parents' living room in England, and I watched Soviet tanks rolling in and into Budapest and crushing, killing people not much older than me. And I rushed upstairs and started packing my suitcase. And my mother came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to Budapest. I had no idea where Budapest was. And she said, what on earth for? And I said, there's something so horrible happening there that I have to go. And she said, don't be so silly. And I burst into tears. And bless her, she understood. She understood how vital this issue was for me. So she said, you're much too, you're only 13, you're much too young to be useful. But if you'll just unpack your suitcase, I'll see to it that you get trained so you can do something in the world. And she did. She sent me off at the age of 16 to work in a holiday home for concentration camp survivors. So I spent the summer peeling potatoes and listening to the stories the horrific stories of people who had been tortured, starved, and their relatives killed. And then I went on to work in various refugee camps and orphanages and made my way to southern Africa, where I lived for 10 years. Now, I'm here because most of us have no clue what's really happening in the world. Did you know how much we spend on militarizing the planet every year? The year before last, it was $1,686 billion. Whereas 30 billion would wipe out starvation worldwide, 
and uh, as little as 11 billion would provide clean water and sanitation for every child on earth. Can you get the enormity of that? It's obscene. How did we humans get to a point where we are so controlled by militarization that we allow hundreds of thousands of people to starve to death and to have no clean water ever in their lives? So when I looked at these figures, I thought, I've been working to try to enable people to stop other people killing each other for 45 years. <clears throat> and in those 45 years, working first of all from the top down, I spent 21 years getting nuclear weapons policy makers from all the nuclear weapons countries to talk to each other. It took a long time to get there. And uh, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but what we learned gradually enabled individuals to talk to each other as people rather than as enemies and to develop the basis for two major nuclear treaties. Then I went on to say to myself, okay, this is what's happening up there, but what's happening down here? And I had a hunch that local people know best how to stop conflict in their own countries. So I sent out a researcher for a year to map how many responsible, accountable, locally led peace initiatives are there in the world. And he came back and said to me, I can map 350 of them. And so we wrote up 50 of them in a book called War Prevention Works and showed how many deaths they prevented, how much it had cost, and what had been the long-term result. And built an organization called Peace Direct. Peace Direct supports people like I'm going to tell you about in a moment who risk their lives daily so that other people don't get killed. Here's an example. Oh, this, I'll come back to this in a second. This is Gulilai Ismail. She works in northwest Pakistan, which is probably the most dangerous place in the world to be a woman. When she was 15, she started something called Aware Girls to get girls into school. And her colleague, Malala Yousafzai, was shot in the head for doing just that. And then you probably remember she got the Nobel Peace Prize. Completely undeterred, Gulilai has gone on now, she's 26, to do the following. It takes my breath away. She trains teams of young men and young women to go into the madrasas, here's a picture of them, to go into the madrasas and identify the young men who are being trained for jihad and go home with them to their families to talk with the parents about why the Quran would not condone suicide bombing. And they have so far prevented over 203 suicide bombings from taking place. These are my heroes. They're the bravest people in the world, people like Gululai. So I'm gonna go back a bit um, and in this book, that, that's the reason why I'm here, is I decided, once I had done a couple of chapters on why we still fight, why we still believe a military solution is the only solution, and asked myself, okay, what are the alternatives that we know that actually work? So I isolated 25 initiatives both at local level, national level, and international level that actually produce results in terms of preventing war. I costed them, and then I scaled up that cost 
globally and over 10 years. And you will never believe, having seen the figures I showed you just now, namely that figure at the top, how much these 25 initiatives will cost. Just under $2 billion over a 10-year period. It's nothing. And what's more, it's doable. And we spend, as you may or may not know, $9 billion on ice cream every year. $2 billion to run strategies globally that will prevent war. I'm not talking about picking up the pieces of war once it's happened. I'm not talking about the UN peacekeeping forces that try and keep people apart after a war. I'm talking about the essential work that goes into prevention. Just like a previous speaker was saying on this stage, preventing heart disease, preventing cancer is far cheaper and far more effective than trying to deal with it when it's already happened. The same is true for war. So that's all set out in great detail. And then I start to ask myself, OK, what skills are needed so that people can do this? Because it's not just um, international groups of highly trained specialists who do this. It's people who learn mediation, people who learn what's the way of enabling people to understand each other. How do you build bridges between people who hate each other instead of bombing those bridges? This is the key. So I took apart what we need to learn, all of us, every person in this room can learn the skills that are needed to stop conflict in your workplace, in your community, and in your child's school, even in your home. I'll give you one example that's close to home for me. In my local village where I live in Oxfordshire in England, there's a little primary school. And my friend's child was at the primary school and came home and said, Mommy, there's such a lot of noise, I can't learn, and, and people are bullying me in the playground, beating me up in the playground. And the mum was really distressed, and she went, she thought about it, and she was somebody who loves calm. She's a gardener, like me, and we have allotments, we have gardening patches close to one another. And so she went into the school, and she said to the head teacher, would you mind if I were to come into the school at the beginning of the school day and lead the children in a period of five to ten minutes, complete quiet. And I will show them nice ways to do that. And um, I think she probably learned from something that I was doing in my greenhouse. Um, everybody know what a greenhouse is? It's what you have in a garden to grow your plants in, right? And I used to go in there and sit just to have a period of quiet, get in touch with the earth, which really gives me my strength to do what I do. And I was sitting on my chair in the greenhouse when Cosimo, who's my neighbor's, another neighbor's son, who was then six years old, comes in and says, what are you doing, Scylla? And I said, well, I'm meditating. And he said, what's that? And I explained about breathing in for five counts, pausing, and then breathing out for six counts. And he said, can I do that? And I said, yeah, sure you can. And so I got him a little stool, put it in front of me with a candle, and we both sat down facing each other. And he said, what now? And I said, well, what would you like to meditate on, Cosimo? And he thought for a long time, and he said, rhubarb. I said, OK, we're going to meditate on rhubarb. And that's exactly what we did. Now, he's now 11. And regularly, he comes into the garden and says, can we meditate? Kids love this period of respite from being hyperactive and busy, which is what he was. So that's just one of the things that work. And as a result of my friend's initiative, the kids themselves ask for this every day. The 
quietness happens every morning and it's spreading to many schools in the region. Such a simple thing. But it's giving kids a way of making their way into calm self-confidence, which is so desperately needed in the world we live in, and into taking time, to taking that period of quietness that's necessary to restore our sanity. The other skills that I now teach to major corporates, I, I teach the uh, global leadership team, which is 21 global presidents of the biggest, most successful um, luxury cosmetics and uh, clothes chains and handbags in the world. Uh, and I was invited in to enable them to listen to each other. And so um, I taught them the listening exercise. And when I first started, they said, we know perfectly well how to listen. It's not a problem. Um, and they started looking at their phone and crossing their legs and looking bored. And I said, let's just check how good you are at listening. Because most of us think we are, but we're actually not. And what happened was after the first round of listening to another person for five minutes, giving them your full attention, and then being able to repeat back to them what they said, do you know what that amounts to? It amounts, amounts to paying them respect because you're actually hearing what they're saying rather than simply making up what you're going to say, which is what we normally do when we think we're listening. And then you change over. So if you've got a friend or a family member or somebody you work with, with whom you're in total friction, you can say to them, would you be willing to spend half an hour with me? We'll sit down opposite each other and I will listen to you for, let's say, five minutes. And then I'll repeat back to you what I've heard you say. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. And then we'll change over. And I can guarantee that in that way, you get beyond what's in your mind, which is I'm right and you're wrong, to your heart that says, oh my God, is that how he feels? And then you're in a different place entirely. You're in a place where you can actually build that bridge between the two of you because it's not built on righteousness. It's built on shared feelings. And it's very simple, but it's not always easy to do with someone you hate. So um, I want to just conclude by saying in order to be useful, uh, useful people need tools. And so at the end of the book, I've put a toolbox um, which contains all these exercises that we use, uh, including how to hold a meeting that isn't boring. I can't stand boring meetings. And so I wanted to put together my thoughts on how you, you hold a meeting that leads, leaves people feeling energized. Because all these things enable us not only to get to the top of our organizations without competing, but also to have the influence we need in order to bring about real shift in our community or in our workplace or even just in our local, um, uh, uh, our local environment. So here are the first five strategies that people have come forward and said they want to help me with since the book was published in English last September. Um, we're developing a united corporate community of leaders aligned to support the prevention of war. And I'm a actually challenging them to work out how they can make money out of preventing conflict. Then we're activating the social ac architecture for peace, which is what Mandela set up in South Africa when he came out of jail. National, local, and uh, village peace committees whose job it is to work out a peace plan for their area. 
we're leading a program for divestment in weapons production. In other words, removing the huge shareholdings that there are in weapons production companies. And moving on, we're training women to break the cycle of violence by actually becoming present or putting themselves forward to be present at peace negotiations. Currently, there's only between 3.5 and 11% of women who are actually present at peace negotiations. Result, those peace treaties usually last only five years. But when more women are present, uh, those treaties last another 10 years. Why? Because women who have to care for the victims of war bring the needs of the wounded, the bereaved, PTSD soldiers and so on, and the orphans to the peace table and get their needs looked after. And that's why the peace treaty lasts much longer. And we're funding a whole lot more locally-led peace initiatives. I'll leave you with um, the four more that we're setting up at the moment. So anybody who wants to get involved can get in touch on my website. And um, I've got one last thing to say before I stop talking. And that's this. that a lot of young people come to me and say, the world is in such a mess. What on, I feel depressed, I feel angry. What on earth can I do? They use other words than I've used, polite words. And so I say to them, what's going on inside you? What is your passion? What breaks your heart? And they tell me it's either refugees or it's, wounded animals, or it's global warming. And I say, okay, what are your skills? Are you good at social media? Can you crowdfund? Are you good at listening to people? So match your skills to your heartbreak, and then you'll know your way forward. That's what happened to me. I was matching my skills to my heartbreak, and I guarantee that in 18 months, you won't be lonely and helpless anymore. You'll be having a fantastic time with your friends, making the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silla. Thank you so much. It's such an inspirational talk. And now I'd like to welcome John to the stage. Take it away, John. Thank you so much. Is this working? Yes, thank you, Sela. That was beautiful. Thank you. And I think what we're, all, what we're talking about here, what Sela was just talking about, is, is consciousness. I guess I need the clicker. Thank you. Of course. Sorry. Consciousness revolution. And you and I are, happen to be living in what I think is the, perhaps going to be considered the most amazing time in human history. We're in the middle of a consciousness revolution. Before I get into that in any more detail, I'd just like to have you imagine something for a moment. You might want to close your eyes. It's not necessary, but you might want to. And just imagine for a moment that you're hovering up above the Earth. You've come from another solar system. And you're looking down at the Earth. What do you see? You see this amazing, beautiful planet that's filled with incredible resources. Beautiful. And you also see the dominant species that seems to have gone crazy. The human species dominates the planet and is in the process of murdering each other and destroying the planet itself. What do you do if you're hovering above looking down and you see this situation? What do you do? Well, you might just watch for a while, because you don't want to get involved in that. But after a while, you might decide, hmm, in order to protect this special planet, maybe we're going to have to get rid of that dominant species. But then you look a little more closely, 
And you see that there's one place on this planet where something is very different. This is in the headwaters of the Amazon River Basin, parts of Ecuador and Peru, a little bit of Colombia, where indigenous people who've been hating each other at war for centuries, tribes, nations, have been killing each other for centuries, and suddenly they've all come together because they know that they have to save their territory, not by fighting each other. Wars used to be territorial, but they have to save their planet from the rest of humanity. They have to save that place, the rainforest, and the planet. So you see this special, special place. And that gives you hope because a seed is happening there. It's a seed that tells us all, humanity, that we can come together, we must come together to save this beautiful planet for ourselves and all future generations. And so we'll come out of that journey now and know that it's a very important question is asked here now. What would we do? How do we deal with these aliens who might be looking down and saying, should we destroy those human beings? Because the aliens are coming. By most estimates of science, they'll be here within 20 years. And they're being created in the laboratories of Google and Amazon and many startup organizations. It's artificial intelligence. And we heard yesterday um, from Bruno Marion about artificial intelligence. It looks like it's going to be here within 20 years and be smarter than us at many levels. And one of the things that it will probably do, it probably won't be able to do a lot of the things that we do, but it probably will look at situations objectively. And it will analyze crises that are happening and come up with solutions that are not based on ego. They're not based on nationalism. They're not based on jealousy. And so are we going to listen? And I think the people of the Amazon, this particular area, have been listening for some time. I was a Peace Corps volunteer there back in 1968, before most of you were born, I think. And at one point, I nearly died. I, was, I lost a lot of weight. I couldn't keep down any food. I was dying. A shaman saved my life in one night because he took me on a shamanic journey that changed my perception, my consciousness. This is about a consciousness revolution. During that one night, I saw that the food I was eating with these people, things like squirming white grubs, worms, and other foods that were very unfamiliar to me, I would eat these foods because there was nothing else to eat. And I'd hear a voice saying, it'll kill you, probably my mother. But on that shamanic journey, I saw how the same food was making the people who lived there healthy. They were fine. And so in that one night, I discovered that it wasn't the food that was killing me, it was my consciousness. It was my perception. After that, this is 1968, after that I became the shaman's apprentice. I've studied shamanism for many years. And um, one of the things that I constantly learn from shamans in Indonesia and Iran and Egypt, all over Latin America, is that it's all about consciousness. It's all about perception. There are two realities, really. Um, there's what we call objective reality, this microphone, and perceived reality, the words I'm speaking. So this slide is a good example of how perception, human perception determines reality. We control reality through our perception. So back before Copernicus, most everybody believed that everything revolved around the Earth. It was a perception. And that impacted everything, religion, culture, business, sex lives, everything. And when Copernicus proved that that wasn't true, that the Earth was just one planet rotating around the sun, everything changed. By changing that perception, everything changed. And human beings are completely controlled. There are no corporations. There's no Czech Republic. There's no United States. There's no Russia, except as we perceive it. 
And when enough people accept a perception, it changes reality. When enough people accept a perception or codify it into law, it becomes reality. The Czech Republic is a great example of how those changes happened back in the late 80s and early 90s. So we can really see that you can have a reality here. In the case of me in the Amazon, it was eating these foods. And I had a perception, it was a perception bridge, that the foods were killing me. It took me to another objective reality. I was dying. As soon as I changed the perception, my reality changed. That's the change in consciousness that we're talking about. And today, this is a picture of a spiral galaxy that's very similar to ours. We are having a whole awakening, a whole consciousness revolution in what our relationship is to the, to the galaxy, to our own galaxy, to the solar system. That's a picture. There's over 3,000 galaxies in that picture taken from the Hubble telescope. But there's actually an estimated 400 billion galaxies the same size or bigger than the Milky Way. That is changing our perception of everything as we know it. So we go back to this perception bridge idea of how we move, how do we change our consciousness. And we're at this critical time in human history today where I think we all know that we're in serious crises. The glaciers are melting, the oceans are rising. We're having a lot of wars, species are going extinct at unacceptable rates. Uh huh. Well, I was an economic hitman, <laughs> as I wrote about in the book. And that job, I was, my real title was chief economist, but my job was, in essence, to steal resources from what we call developing countries for our big corporations. I'm going to talk a lot more extensively about this tomorrow at another session. But just as a, as a, as a summary, that was my job. And it was my job to create the perception in those countries that we were really helping them. But in fact, we were stealing their resources and we were influencing their politics. We were controlling their governments. I'm using the past tense, but it's still happening. And right now we're seeing once again the struggle between Russia and the United States and China to control more and more of these sorts of resources. Lots of economic hitmen out there today. One of the driving influences was a defining idea that corporations, and in fact, everybody pretty much, needs to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. That, again, I'm going to talk in more detail tomorrow about this, but it was an idea that came out of Milton Friedman winning the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. It had been around before then, but it really took hold then. You have an example here of, uh, of uh, Professor Klaus, who initiated, I was a very strong disciple of Milton Friedman. Again, more about that later. What we've really done here is created a death economy. This is an economic system that's based on militarization. Incredible. We saw the figures up there, $1.6 billion worldwide, and unfortunately, my country pr pr contributes the 0 .7 bi uh, 700 billion, sorry, it's 1.6 thousand billion. <laughs> it's an outrageous figure. Um, it's a death economy that's based to a large degree on militarization and even more on destroying the very resources upon which it depends, demolishing the resources that the future d demands of it. That's this death economy we've created. And we need to move into something that I call a life economy. This is an economic system that's based on cleaning up pollution and regenerating destroyed environments, recycling new technologies that don't require us to dig up the earth anymore, using the sun and the wind, even more. I mean, hopefully the solar technologies we have today are going to look archaic five years from now and 10 years from now. So we move into, we move from this death economy. You have, this, you have the objective reality of the world has many natural and human resources. 
The perceived reality is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs, and you get an economy that's depleting resources. It's catastrophic. It can't continue. If we simply change the perception, we still have the same objective reality, a world full of natural resources and human resources. But you change the perception to you say that success is paying investors to profit by public service, cleaning up pollution, regenerating the environment, recycling new technologies. You come to the life economy, which is an economic system that is itself a renewable resource. That's part of this consciousness revolution. You and I are living at a time where we have this opportunity to create something that indigenous people have always had. And we, let's face it, we, every one of us comes from an indigenous background. Indigenous cultures have always known that you have to have a life economy, an economic system that's a renewable resource. It's only been within the last couple of hundred years, and especially the last 50 years, the last 20 years, that we've gone so far astray in this. So the opportunity is here for all of us to create something very, very special. Uh, that was just a reminder that I'm going to be talking more about this tomorrow on the global stage. Um, I wanted to show this slide because over here you have the Andromeda galaxy. It's moving at about 250,000 miles an hour toward the Milky Way, toward us. And it's going to cannibalize us. It'll take 4 billion years. But any of you who are still around 4 billion years from now, or have decided to come back at that time, you may experience this. Although they tell you it's not going to be violent because there's so much space between all the planets and stars, we'll probably be OK. But I just think that's a marvelous picture and a marvelous thought. It sort of puts things in perspective as who are we in this universe? What is our consciousness? What is your consciousness? So you might be asking yourself, what is your role in all of this? What is your part? And the title of my talk was The Consciousness Revolution and You. I think there's, there's really five things every one of you can do, must do, I challenge you to do, I hope you will do. First of all, be conscious of your dream. What is it you most want in life? What is your greatest desire? What will bring you bliss? What will bring you the greatest happiness? Because that's the only way to be successful, is to do that. And look at it on three levels, personal, professional, and your sphere of influence. Describe how your dream can support a life economy. Be part of this new challenging time, this life economy. And then put that in writing. So I've stated my own, and you want to keep it brief. Again, my, my friend uh, Bruno talked about this yesterday and may later this afternoon on the stage. Keep it brief. Mine would be I will recycle more, be less materialistic. That's the personal. The professional is, I'm a writer, and I speak out. I will write and speak about life economic supporting stories. And the third one, the sphere of influence, I will use social media and other venues to inspire. If you're a carpenter and you love carpentry, then you can say you know, something like, I will use more recyclable materials. I will use more sustainable materials. I will constantly tell my clients that even though it may cost a little bit more, they're investing in their children's future. And I will keep spreading the word among other carpenters. Whatever you do, every one of you has passion and you all have skills. I don't know what your individual ones are, but I know you have them. So put them to work in this way. And then every morning, read at least one of these three things in part three, or you may want to read them all, and commit yourself to doing them, and commit yourself to taking some action every day to make that happen. You know, as a writer, I know it's important that every day I write. Maybe I only write for an hour. Maybe I write for five hours, but I have to write. Whatever you do, you know, 
be conscious of acting in ways that you do that, that help to create this life economy, help to move us from a death economy to a life economy. Ah, I wanted to end with this picture I just took a few months ago in the Amazon. I go there a lot. I'm headed there after this. Take groups of people there, and I take groups of people to Kogi in Colombia, in the Maya in Guatemala, and I'd love to have you come with me. Uh, go to my website. I, I take groups. Be, they're great. It's a great way to learn about these cultures. But the, these people talk about the perception bridge themselves, and they talk about touching the jaguar. They say that on that perception bridge stands a jaguar. And that's what keeps us from moving from one consciousness to another. The jaguar that keeps us. And in order to move into a new consciousness, we have to touch the jaguar. We have to confront that which we most fear. Because if we run from it, it'll just follow us. But if we touch it, it gives us its energy and we can move forward. So as you move through these things in your life, ask yourself, what is your Jaguar? What's keeping you back from following your heart's desire, from doing what you most want to do? And when you identify that, go out and touch it. Take its energy. Don't run from it. Don't deny it. And I think in our culture today, one of the Jaguars that is keeping us from moving from a death economy to a life economy is our fear of change. And that's something we must touch that fear of change, knowing that we do need to make radical changes in our economic, social, and political systems. And as I'm writing a book called Touching the Jaguar, which is my next book, which should be out in about a year, a couple of months ago, I was kayaking in this river in the Amazon. <laughs> and this beautiful female jaguar just swims right across my path, and I nearly hit her with a kayak. So I thought that was a good sign. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so sign up for my newsletter. Go to my website, John Perkins, and come, come with me on a trip. And I just want to, end, <laughs> want to end this discussion with a quote from the Dalai Lama. That's me. I should have let my hair grow longer, I think, don't you think? <laughs> and I was a little younger at the time. But the Dalai Lama, I took a group to spend time with the Dalai Lama in his house in Dharamsala, India. And one of the people in the group asked, they say, said, so you know, there's a writer in the United States, it wasn't me, but there's a writer in the United States who's advocating that everybody in the world take five minutes at a certain time on a certain day and pray for peace. What do you think about that, Your Holiness? And the Dalai Lama said, well, praying for peace or meditating on peace, that's a really good idea. But if that's all you do, it's a waste of time and probably counterproductive. So, Pray for peace, meditate on peace, and go out every day and take actions that make peace happen. Pray, dream, meditate, go into your dream, find your bliss, and act every day. And let's create a, a life economy. And I, I wanted to mention that out in the, the, the work I do in the Amazon is with the Pachamama Alliance. How many, how many of you here have ever heard of the Pachamama Alliance? Okay, I'm one of the founders, and it's a great institution. Go to that website, go to my website, come to the Amazon with me, and hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow and talk more about the death and life economy in much more detail and what economic hitmen really do, because it's exciting and nasty stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Am I? You are. Um, speaking to <laughs> yeah. you. Um, it was written as a result of working, as you say, with people at all levels. But I'm convinced that right now, as we speak in this moment, there are millions, thousands of millions of people all over the world who don't want to go on living the way we are living, who are suffering because of the way we're living, just as John yeah. said, and who want to be active. And in, in my way, I wanted to offer them tools that will work, whether they're working in their own environment or at the level of their own governments or internationally. Because it, this, this change needs to happen everywhere. But my impression is that there's more energy at the grassroots than there is at the top. The, the decision makers at the top today are very stuck. The United Nations can't do its job for a very good reason. That is that if you look at the five permanent members of the Security Council of the UN, that's Britain, France, China, the US, and Russia, these are regularly the five biggest arms sellers in the world. So no wonder we have war. And is that, and is that how your book has been received? You perceive that there's a huge amount of a reaction at, at a level where we feel we can become involved, but you're really seeing this being stuck at the top. I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the energy of every person in this room, if it's brought to bear on these issues, and please come to my website and to John's website and have a look and see what it is you can do. Because uh, every one of us can not just alter this in a small way, but start a leverage which makes change happen oh, yeah. oh, oh, right across the world. Yeah, and we'll go into that in a little bit, I hope. John, before we move on, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you've got an ex enormous experience of this high level of business, of industry, these Fortune 500, you know, the UN, uh, the American government. You know, I think you, you just explained how a shaman, shaman changed your life. You know, I've got to ask you, what was, what's the reaction of your revolution of consciousness at this high level in business? I mean, how was it taken initially by big business? What, what is the, what's been the reaction there with that power base? Well, that's a, it's a great question. And, and I, think it's, I think actually I have an encouraging answer. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, in my experience, there's an awful lot of top government officials and CEOs who want change. Right. Less than a year ago, or maybe just about a year ago, I was speaking at the St. Petersburg Russia International Economic Forum. President Putin was there too, and many heads Lady of- Lady Belgar now, Putin. <laughs> many, many, and, and uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Gutierrez, and many CEOs, and, and I mixed with them a lot during receptions, as well as being a speaker there, just hanging out with them. And after giving a talk like, like this one, I had so many of them come up to me and say, especially the CEOs, we want to change our companies, but we don't know how because we're afraid that if we lose half a percentage of market share or our stock goes down, our top investors will fire us and replace us with people who only care about market share and stock prices. And so they feel like they're caught in a dilemma. And they would say very much like what you just said, Silla, that it's up to us. You know, I had the president of Nike, uh, Mark Parker, one time say that, that he w wishes that everybody would send him an email. And if every one of you sends him an email, uh, sends an email to Nike and, and gets all of your social networking circles to s send an email saying, I love your products, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia or wherever a fair wage. He wants to get that. And then he can show that to his investors. Yeah. I mean, because the system is stuck in the, in, the, in the stock markets. It's stuck with this idea of maximizing short-term profits. So that's a, that's a perception that we have to change. And I find that there's an awful lot of business executives that wanted to change that. There's also the sociopaths who don't give a damn, yeah. don't care. But they are driven by success. And right now we define success as profit maximization. If we change that, 
if we start putting on the covers of our most important magazines and on our television shows executives who are moving toward a life economy, yeah. then the sociopaths will move toward a life economy too because that will make them popular and successful. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Silly, did you want to come back on that? No, 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 totally yeah, but I mean, you know, since you wrote the original book and since you've, you know, had your initial revolution in consciousness, you've actually practiced what you've preached and you've got, you know, decades of experience of, of building more sustainable businesses that have less negative, less of the death economy. And just wonder, is it, is it changing? You've talked about the potential that you're seeing this, but are we moving in the direction? Is there, is there a lot to be optimistic about in the way businesses is, is moving? In the industries you've been working in. Yeah, I think there's. I, I think we have every reason to be optimistic, but we have to make it happen. Right. I think the optimism comes from being here, yeah. and you know, I'm, I, I spend most of my life traveling around the world, speaking, and, and everywhere I go, there's hundreds, thousands, whatever, many people who want to hear this, yeah. who want to participate in this consciousness revolution. It's happening, but we and we have to make it happen. Yeah. More and more and more. There's no question. We, we, every one of us needs to take daily actions, and, and even very small ones. Since sending an email, you know, or just talking to someone on the phone, it doesn't matter. But something. Every one of us uh, t uh, should, you know, should. It's important to, to take those actions. And incidentally, I, I forget to mention that that list I had of the five things to do. It's great. It's going to be in my next newsletter that'll come out. That comes out once a month. So if you if you didn't take, take notes and you're wondering what are those five things, subscribe to the newsletter. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting you both put together, as you say, tools, Tiller, Tiller. You know, you're putting it in reach for us to be able to become involved in a way that's never been available before. I think the key thing is, is to get into the public domain what we know that works to bring about a less fearful society. Because what the media generally does is it seeks out the most scary news, the most bloodthirsty news, the most horrific news. We, we have an expression in the UK that says, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, that the worst news is at the top of the news agenda. Now, it's up to us to make our own news, whether locally or on one of the many websites that there are now. For example, replacing rich lists. You know what I mean by a rich list? A list of the richest people in the world. Why don't we have a list of the people who contribute the most to a, f a safer world? Why don't we have a list that says this, this, this person, a whole hundred of them that have made the greatest contribution to improving the world. Because we're all broadcasters now in a way that we weren't 10 years ago. It's, you know, the, the ability to do this is in all of our grasp in a way, in, in a time of mass media, it just, it just wasn't. Yeah, if I could add to that, I think you know, we are in this time now where the, the media is being really put down. Yeah. It's being put down by the president of the country. I come from yeah. the United States, Trump, in a big, big way. The, fake, the idea of fake news, and there's a lot of fake news. There's no question about it. There's also a lot of good news, yeah. and there's a lot of good reporting, and there's a lot of good writers, and there's a lot of good documentary filmmakers, and and we need to we need to understand that, and we need to support the good ones, yeah. and let go of the, <laughs> of the fake ones. And we don't want people being turned off by the negativity in in the mass media because it's damaging. But I, we've only got a bit of time before we want to take a couple of questions. I just wanted to. I just wanted to go from the sort of very big to the very small. Um, and this is Scylla, in, in your book you talk, and, and in working with you before, I know you talk a, a lot about us needing to do our own inner work first. Uh, and I know you mentioned meditation as a start of it, but I just wondered if you could just expand on that, that a bit. And what, what do you mean? What, what inner work do we need to do? Well, uh, can everybody hear us all right? It seems very echoey. Can you hear? You can. Good. Um, the reason why self-knowledge and self-reflection, the kind that John talked about, is vital, is the following. When we try to be active and we're driven by fear and anger, those we're trying to convince can feel it. When I started the work on nuclear weapons, I was furious that my country 
could be making decisions on new missiles without even informing Parliament. And I was uh, angry that my daughter would be exposed to these amounts of radiation all through her life. And when I started talking to the people who make the decisions on nuclear weapons, the physicists who designed the warheads, the military who did the strategy, the arms corporations like Lockheed Martin who make the missiles and the submarines that carry these weapons, and those in the Ministry of Defense who sign the checks, and countries like yours that harbor the weapons. Um, when I started talking to those people, they could feel my anger and my fear. So they were not interested in listening to me. So I learned that I had to transform that. I had to take my own shadow, my own darkness, if you like, and work on it until I could face my own shadow, like touching the Jaguar. And it was only when I did that that things started to change and the people I wanted to talk to could hear my voice. And um, so that's why I believe that we all, in order to do the most effective work that we can in the world, have to do the inner work at the same time. And, and does that also include um, tuning into your own intuition? Sorry? Does that also include your, rely on your own intuition? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, uh, the times when I've overridden my intuition have made the biggest mistakes of my life, really serious ones. And so... And this is someone who's been nominated for the Nobel Prize for these three times. <laughs> but it, 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 it's true. Yeah, I know, um, so no, it's, it's I once good convinced message. a friend of mine who was very wealthy to lend a million euros to somebody who wanted to organize a peace festival. Um, and I believed that this young man was going to pull it off. In the end, he didn't. And if I'd listened to my intuition, I would have known that. I think it's an important lesson. And John, just before we go to questions, I just wanted to ask you about your own inner work. Does, does that chime, chime with you? Do you feel that there's been a huge transformation internally as well as a change of perspective, that this has to be work from you to get from the person you were to where you are now? Well, yes, and I, I, I love what you said about intuition. You know, I, I look at it, the shamanic way of looking at it is it's the spirit speaking to us. And that's what inspiration is. When you think about it, you know, inspiration or imagination. I magus, I the magus, I the, the shaman, the, the magus. So when we listen to the spirit speaking to us, we're inspired. And it's a voice from someplace, you know, you can call it anything you want. Mm -hmm. This consciousness, the universe, we look out at that scene of the universe, the spiraling and the tremendous numbers of, of, of yes. galaxies out there. Uh, there's got to be a big consciousness someplace out there that's organizing all this. I don't know what we want to call it, you know, but to me, it's, it's, it is listening to the intuition or taking that guidance. And as a writer, I know that's when I do my best writing, too. Yeah, I can muse, yeah. Um, thank you both. Have we got, um, I think we have microphones out there. There's a question right at the front there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I think it was filled with very useful information that everyone should be exposed to. Um, and uh, your journeys are both very inspiring. I, you both touched upon a very important issue in both of your talks, which I don't think people are getting enough exposure to, which is you know, much like the Gutenberg Press when it was invented, brought down the limits to information that people could be exposed to, the internet is doing the same today. So the reason you can show us your websites right now is because we have a free and unlimited access to information. But last year, the United States uh, Federal Commissions of Communication repealed an Obama-era uh, uh, law which mandated that all information be treated equally on the internet. It was called net neutrality, and it was repealed last year. 
So now, internet service providers eff effectively have the ability to throttle access to information. Uh, how, which is, you know, if we're going to revolutionize our consciousnesses, we need to have access to this information on how to do it, you know, how to go forward. But with the advent of AI, which you spoke about, Mr. Perkins, it will be possible to survey and control everything that we have access to. So I agree that in 20 years, AI will have revolutionized the way we interact, but it could also be used for very nefarious purposes. How do you see, how do you think we should respond to this, sort of this threat to our free access to undoctored information? Well, I, I would start by saying that it's your passion and that should be one of your things that you get up every morning and decide you're going to take action about. You sound like you're very inspired and you're knowledgeable and you need to rally people. We need to rally people. It, it gets down to people power again. It gets down to this consciousness. So it's about consciousness. And any, maybe there's other people out there who just heard you and would want to get together with you after this meeting. And I would suggest that form a group, get something going, really take action on that. You know, that's your, it's obviously your passion. <laughs> and you also have some skills in there, I have no doubt. So it's, that's what it's going to take is for people like you and, and the rest of us, and I, I'll be with you on that. I'd love to get involved in it with you. Uh, you can email me at my website uh, to move forward and make it happen. Really good. Get, we gotta fight that. We've gone through things like that many times before. The Gutenberg Press went through things like that. The church tried to suppress it, but the people didn't allow it to happen. And I would just underline what John's saying, is that we're sitting here we have enough to eat, we've got education, we've got a roof over our head, and nobody is shooting at us. So it's up to us to make our voices heard. If not us, who? And if not now, when? So when you get home tonight, send that email to the CEO of a company that you feel is threatening the planet. When you read an article or hear a piece of news about some uh, department of state or some corporation which is doing something that is contrary to your moral, ethical sense, get your message across to them. Because if you just sit there and feel like a victim, nothing is going to change. Thank you. We've got time for one, one more question, I think. We don't? Oh, okay. There's one. There's somebody here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yuri. I would like to thank you a lot for your inspirational speech. Uh, Mr. Perkins, I would like to ask you why you didn't become a shaman if you are doing that for a long period of time and instead of being a shaman, you started to actually do the death economy. Um, how did it happen? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I, I graduated from business school and I joined the Peace Corps because I didn't believe in the war in Vietnam. I didn't want to be drafted. Peace Corps was a way to get out of the draft. Peace Corps sent me to the Amazon. I had no desire to do any of that. And it did change my life, and I went through that, that incredible experience, and I, I ended up loving the Amazon. But when I got out, I was recruited by a consulting firm to do what I had been trained to do in business school. And in those days, and still, we are taught, the economic theory is that if it is a poor country and you want to help it grow, you invest billions of dollars into infrastructure. So I arranged for those loans through the World Bank and others, and I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow. And in any case, those loans then were, went to help our own corporations, and often the, the country suffered. But I thought at the beginning that I was doing the right thing, because it's what I was taught in business school. It's what the World Bank tells us. It's what business schools still tell us. So I thought I was doing the right thing. I think because I'd been in the Peace Corps, after a few years I began to see through the system 
I began to see that it wasn't helping the majority of the people in those countries. It was only helping the very rich people as well as our corporations. And once I began to see the system, I was kind of stuck in it for a little while. But I, but I spent, I, and within 10 years, I got out. And so after doing that for 10 years, I got out and at that point made the commitment to spend the rest of my life uh, doing whatever I could to use what I knew about the system to try to change it. And that started back in 1981. Uh, 1980, so ever since then, I've been on the, and, and the shamanism that I'd done be, in that space between business school and being an economic hitman, shamanism taught me that we can change this through changing perceptions. I love to write, and so I decided I would use writing to try to make that happen. It's one of your skills, one of your passions. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my skills. It was one of my passions, and hopefully I've got some skill one in of it, your too. skills, yeah. But, but I, I think I, and as I look back, I think I had to go deep down into that darkness of being an economic hitman in order to emerge into the light. I mean, I like to look at it that way. And I know that, you know, the knowledge that I gain by doing that really allows me to look at the system from the inside. Well, we're really glad you did. I'm afraid we've only just scratched the surface of the incredible work of uh, John Perkins and Dr. Silla Elworthy. Thank you so much for joining us um, today for The Peace is Possible. It certainly is, but it, we've got to make our voices heard. That seems to be it. Um, Dr. Silla Elworthy has some books available if you'd like to, uh, to join her and um, have a chat with her. And John is also um, available afterwards if you want to say hello. You've got some books here as well. And do join uh, John's mailing list. We, thank you very much. There's just one last thing to do. Um, thank you very much for all your questions. We actually have the director um, of uh, Audioteca, which is the partner for uh, Melting Pot, the talk series here at Ostrava. And today they are launching the audio books of uh, Dr. Silla Elworthy and John Perkins. It is the um, New Confessions of the Economic Hitman and the Business Plan for Peace. And the great news is for everyone here um, at the festival, there's going to be a free download of these audio books um, during the festival. So it's a great opportunity to find out more of Scylla and John's work. And we are going to launch them right now, I believe. So I'd like to welcome onto stage Miss um, Petra uh, Langrova. <laughs> se dostal do stádia metastáze. Rozšířil se přes hospodářsky rozvojové země do spojených států a zbytku celého světa, ohrožuje samotné základy demokracie a život na planetě jako takový. Tato kniha je pro všechny, kdo chtějí vykročit ze své bezmocnosti a najít způsob, jak své vlastní dovednosti mohou využít k tomu, aby něco udělali se záležitostmi, jimž nyní čelíme. Je určena milionům lidí, kteří jsou v současné době vyděšení tím, co o válce viděli. Hello, I am so proud and so glad that Audioteca publish audiobooks from Silla Elworthy and John Perkins for Czech listeners. And I would like to wish the audiobooks very many listeners. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but, but to the launch of your wish of Santa. Thank you so much. To the launch of the audiobooks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we should have had this champagne before we gave our talks. Can, can I just say thank you to our incredible translators so that people of all abilities can hear what we've been saying. And saying. More inclusivity.